career gifts and uh, experiences. So now let's transition to the world outside. So we've been insular. We've been thinking about things inside and talking to each other about the things we do. So now we get a chance to actually open up the windows, look outside, and see what the heck is going on out there. Uh, so it's with my pleasure that I have an opportunity to welcome a senior official from the Department of Energy to give a few remarks on behalf of the DOE's partners behind the C3E. It's particularly neat to have a senior DOE official who's a woman. I guess that must mean there aren't many of them. Uh, but there's more than there used to be, right? Uh, Alice Madden is DOE's Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental and External Affairs. She recently joined DOE after a career in the high-tech industry and service in the Colorado House of Representatives. That's good. She understands politics. Uh, she also has a strong background advancing women and minorities in STEM and sustainability fields. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I am so happy to be here. And I don't know about you, but I was starting to get tears in my eyes listening to your son give you an award. But that was just fantastic. So I get to say, on behalf of the Department of Energy, Secretary Moniz could not be here, because as you probably have heard, he, he worked here not too long ago. So he has an official cooling off period. Um, but on behalf of the Secretary and the Dep Deputy Secretary, Dan Poneman, they wanted me to express their congratulations to all the award winners, a big thank you to all the ambassadors, and really to all of the participants. It's hard to schedule time to come to these things. But aren't you glad you did? I mean, you get it's so important to get recharged, refired up. So thank you for making sure that you're taking care of yourself and getting you to something like this, because I think it's really worthwhile. Um, organizations like C3E, I think, are incredibly important. Um, it started in 2010 uh, with the DOE and the clean energy uh, uh, ministerial countries that are represented right here. And one of the things they did right at the beginning was to identify obstacles and figure out how to knock them down. And what was really keeping women from advancing in clean energy? Depending on how you define the clean energy realm, the representation of women can be like 20 to 30 percent which is completely unacceptable. I think it was Ann Richards who said, Richardson, the former governor of Texas, who said, when asked about women in politics, she said, well, I can't do a Southern accent, but, well, why wouldn't we be in politics? We, we make up half the population and we gave birth to the other half. So <laughs> I love that line. So why shouldn't we be, have a bigger role in clean energy or, frankly, any profession for that matter? Um, and, you know, many of these things that we're, I'm going to talk about in a moment are also true for minorities. Uh, and one of the things they found out is that women, when surveyed, said that they see a lack of role models in these careers. Um, they don't see an exact career path or samples of career paths they feel like they can take. Um, they feel like there's lack of champions in their lives. So C3E, the ambassador program, is one of the things that they devised to sort of address those issues. Um, and the other, this is a really tough one, the sort of vicious circle, the catch-22. Women have really low visibility, so they don't get asked to be on panels. When you're low on the radar, you're not going to be in someone's sight to be on a board. Um, I came from Colorado, and I swear to God, the same five women were on every board. <laughs> and I actually talked to one of them, like, share the wealth. I mean, don't be on another board. You need to start passing on names of other women. It, it was like the women that people felt comfortable with were, were asked to be on 25 boards, which is, you know, just a little ridiculous. So these awards today that we've heard, and, and that's how you help start raising women's profiles. And last but not least, and it's something I really think is important, is, and I, I was guilty of this when I first started practicing law, women don't know how to build professional networks as, as well as, as some other, other folks do, other men do. And it's something you really have to um, proactively do. You need to really think about it. You need to cross-pollinate, pollinate, not just in your own area. And of course, symposiums like this are just the ticket for that. And I'm sure all of you have already put on your favorites, the c3enet.org, right? <laughs> and those are some of the ways that you can keep, keep continuing um, to really network with the women you've met of these past two days, because these are, frankly, relationships you should keep for the rest of your careers. Um, I, when, I was, when I was thinking about career path examples, mine is a little scary. I think this is my eighth career, so I don't know if I'm a good example of, of any particular path. 
But I, I just wanted to note, in each one of the careers I've had, there's been sort of amazing little obstacles, some more insidious than others, some pretty glaring. But my, my first real job was in high tech. Um, there was one female engineer. It was a big company. It was a disk drive manufacturer. There was one female engineer. And then I learned a lot of the engineers were non-degreed engineers. Well, the women that worked there remained techs. The men that got promoted to be non-degreed engineers. And the big difference, besides pay, was when layoffs came. And in the 1980s, layoffs came. And the, the men were safe and the women who were techs were laid off. So just things like that. And I, it took me a while to even to figure that out. I went to law school starting in 1986, and I was one of the first classes that reached 50% women in the class, which was great. Although our bathroom had urinals in it, we, we, we put potted plants in them, made a little pretty. Um, <laughs> there had only been, and I think still has only been, one female dean at the University of Colorado, a, a great school. Um, I did not have a female professor till my third year in law school, and she happened to be a Supreme Court judge who during that year was turned down for professorship at the school. Led to a lot of great protests, really started a whole different side of activism for me um, that I've never let down. Uh, but actually, in retrospect, it's great because um, Jean Dubosky went on to lead some of the most important cases. You know, uh, She became an appellate lawyer and won some of the biggest cases, including knocking down a, um, uh, a discriminatory anti-gay law. Um, so she went on to bigger and better things. But at the time, it really rocked every woman in that school's world and in the whole community. Um, I, then I went to a, a really great law firm, and I thought, finally, enlightenment. You know, there's women partners. It was great. And then I realized all the women were in real estate or wills and estates. There was no female litigators. So in that kind of crazy world of litigation, I didn't have any female role models. And um, my colleagues and I who were doing this work, it was hard. You know, we were... Um, you know, thinking about starting families, uh, I made myself indispensable and uh, ultimately started a family. And my, my law firm folks loved me, but after the congratulations, the next thing that was said was, well, you know, you're off partnership track, right? And it was sort of like for my own good, you know, you, know, you, you won't be able to handle all this. So I went to another firm eventually and, and, and uh, really had a practice that I loved. Uh, and when I had kids, my priorities did really change. I was bored to tears with civil litigation. I wanted to have a more meaningful life. And that's when I started getting into politics, started getting into land conservation, and sort of just built sort of a passion. So if your job or what you're in uh, right now or, or what you're in maybe in the beginning of your career isn't everything you'd like, there is room to build that passion outside your job and volunteer positions. And just think about that, because that might end up leading to the job that you really love in the future. Um, I ended up going back to the law school. I got an associate deanship there. The urinals were st still in the bathroom. So I bought a crowbar, and we had a little party, and we pulled out half the wall. <laughs> no one got hurt. <laughs> but the urinals exited the buildings. Um, I changed our boards. Um, I changed the award system. And I just did it. I didn't ask permission. I just did it. And it used to be, I called them the old white guy awards. And I would say, I have nothing against old white guys. Some of my favorite people are old white guys, but they can't be the only people who get awards at ceremonies. So we had rising star awards. We had all different kinds of things. And it, you could just feel the difference walking down the halls. There was the, a wall of um, one big hallway in it of just white portraits of white men, old white men all nice, amazing lawyers, um, but we, we um, changed that up a little bit. It's just little things like that that meant something um, to the women in the school when they saw those changes happening. Um, then I thought, politics. There's a place with no glass ceiling, right? So I, I, um, I was actually, this is when my life really started to change as far as me being more empowered about doing things. Um, I was really involved with the Women's Bar and the Women's Chamber of Commerce, and I put together a seminar called Entering Politics, What's Stopping You? It wasn't for me. It was for other women to run for office, not me. And during, this, during the forum, I was like, what am I waiting for? I mean, this, you know, this, I should be doing this. And I walked over to the Secretary of State's office. I don't even think I had a cell phone. I borrowed their phone. I called my husband. I said, I just picked up an affidavit for one for office. And his answer was, what took you so long? <laughs> so so I, I served in the legislature. I, um, I accidentally um, learned that I was really good at campaigns. Um, led a shift in the uh, power structure in Colorado for the first time in 60 years. Both chambers flipped. 
to my party, and I became majority leader. And that's when I really started getting involved with um, more energy policy. I ultimately became Governor Bill Ritter's climate change advisor, his deputy chief of staff, and most recently, I held a chair at the University of Colorado, the Timothy Worth Chair in Sustainable Development. And all along that path, I, I just, my voice got louder and louder about when I saw something, I just said something. And when I, when I first ran for office, the best piece of advice I got was, don't wait for an invitation, pull up a chair to the table, sit down and start helping. And, and I know so many women who think if I just put my head down and work really hard, I'm, you know, I will be, the rewards will come. Someone will recognize my hard work. When you run for office, you realize sometimes it's okay to promote yourself. It was weird for me to do that, but you know that's part of that job. And it also you know, gave me permission in the rest of my life to make sure that I got credit where, where I needed to. Um, I, uh, and as you develop a leadership practice, you also realize it's really about your team and how you help other people. And, oh, and it's particularly in a, a political realm, but in a business realm, you know, the, the, the whole, when, the, when the whole wins, you win. Um, and in a caucus, if you don't have your caucus, you're not gonna pass anything. And I realized for women, this was a really great spot to be. Um, uh, a lot of people are in politics because they're looking for the next thing to do. And it's pretty obvious. And you know, you probably know some folks like that. And if you show that you have this empathy and understanding and learn the motivation of others and where they want to be in five years, you can build an, an amazing leadership practice where you help the whole team rise. I mean, John F. Kennedy, a rising tide raises all ships. I mean, that's really the way I viewed my leadership uh, in the state legislature. And we were very, very successful and got, as a matter of fact, we went from lagging the country in energy policy to leading it in a few short years, uh, something I'm incredibly, uh, inc incredibly proud of. Uh, and now at DOE, I get to work in state and local policy. Um, the secretary really believes that's where the action's gonna be. Um, states and lo localities are more nimble than Congress. That's probably not a high bar, but it, it's a, um, there's such great potential in cities and states to move real energy policy. And it's really exciting to have the backing of the Secretary of Energy in that. You're gonna hear from Karen Wyman, uh, my colleague who's also working in, in local and state policy. She'll be up here in a moment. And I just wanted to leave you with, with a couple of things. Um, I think it's really important in anything you do to know who you are and know your core principles and surround yourself with some people that you trust. Um, I, I, I think people have fewer and fewer mentors than they have in the past. And I joke it's because of Google. You don't have to ask your stupid questions anymore. You can just type them in. <laughs> but don't hesitate to ask your stupid questions to someone. We had a great lunch today, and Hina, um, one of the women at the table, was asking about mentors. And she said, I have many mentors, some just for a moment. Isn't that great? <laughs> I love that. Um, and I think it's, it's important for you to, you know, to, to seek advice. It gives you more confidence than when you want to act. You know you've talked to somebody that you trust, and you've gotten that foundation so you can move forward and act. Um, and I think the other thing that's important again, and, I, and I'll leave you with this, when you're in a, if you're in a conference like this and you notice that there's always three men and one woman on a panel or you, know, you start noticing that disparities, be a little pro, more proactive. The next time that they have that annual conference, you know, in addition to telling them when you do the surveys that they actually do read, send them suggestions for women to speak. Volunteer to speak yourself. Go to Toastmasters. Figure out how to do public speaking, I know it's painful, and volunteer yourself to speak. You have something to offer right now. The average age of a woman who runs for office in a state legislature in the country is 42. I was 42, I'm very average. The average age of a man who runs for office, 34. Isn't that amazing? I just think, I just think it's amazing. We wait, we think, oh, I need a master's, I need to do this, I need to do that. You're ready now, right? Right? Come on. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. And congrats again to everybody here. Um, and keep coming to things like this and getting recharged. Thanks a lot.